Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Jordi Ingliller. Now Jordi, I realize I've just butchered your name and I'm, I'm sorry for that. But you did refer to me as being Australian during one of our conversations, so I guess now we're even. So Jordi has this fantastic official title and that is Senior Expert Scientist for Machine Learning and Earth Observation at the French Space Agency. And he'll get more into exactly what that title means during the conversation that you're about to listen to. But the hope of this episode is to help you understand a little bit more about the differences between computer vision and the kind of AI that we are using in the Earth observation world. Before we get started today, I want to say a huge thank you to Synergize. So I'm working with Synergize to create a short mini-series of, of episodes, three episodes, that are designed to help help people understand very specific parts of, of the Earth observation world. So we previously published an episode together, which was all about the differences between multispectral and hyperspectral. And now this episode here, which is all about the differences between computer vision and AI in Earth observation. So yeah, this episode is sponsored by Synergize as part of Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem Knowledge Sharing. And there'll be links in the show notes to, to the Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem. So thank you very much, Synergize. I, I really appreciate your support. Hi, Jordi. Welcome to the podcast. Um, I, I start with a, a brief introduction. So and I'm going to do the best I can not to butcher your title. So you're the Senior Expert Scientist for Machine Learning in Earth Observation at the, the French Space Agency. How, how close was I? Close. <laughs> uh, I, I would say I, I'm... Senior expert scientist in machine learning for Earth observation at CNES, the French Space Agency. I love the senior expert. This, this is brilliant. I wish I had that in my title. <laughs> so, would you mind just that, that this is your title, that this is what you do? Would you mind describing that for us, please? What, what does that mean? So, uh, I guess what I'm asking here is a, for a brief introduction. Would you mind introducing yourself to the audience, please, and explaining what that title means? What, what, what do you do? I do research at a lab called CESVIO, which is located in Toulouse, in southern France. And my, my job is to develop algorithms for information extraction from satellite image time series with applications to land cover mapping, geophysical variable extraction, and these kind of things. So I work in machine learning, I write software, and I supervise several grad students. And I have been doing this for more or less 20 years now. Okay, so that definitely explains the senior expert piece of your title. <laughs> um, how how did you get involved? Like, did you uh, do you come from the classic remote sensing background, or uh, do you, do you approach this from a computer vision background? Actually, um, my background is in signal processing and image processing, and then with applications to remote sensing from the physical modeling point of view. So it's a blend of, of uh, applied math with signal processing and image processing and then uh, physical modeling. Yes, more from the physics point, point of view of, of remote sensing. So the hope of, of this episode today, of this conversation, is to help people understand that some of the differences between computer vision and AI when we think about Earth observation. And I wanted to start off by perhaps dividing the topic into two, maybe talking about mapping and, and monitoring. And at least in my mind, this must be part of what you're doing when you are um, creating the, these land cover data sets. Uh, am I on the right track so far? Yes. When we think about computer vision, what, what are some of the key differences between maybe these classic computer vision algorithms? And it's funny to call them classic, but algorithms that come from the computer vision world and algorithms that we might use in, in Earth observation when we talk about identifying objects. Okay. In, in computer vision, actually, we are uh, working with uh, most of the time with RGB images, and we are not uh, interested in, for example, the accurate location of the pixels on sp in space or the uh, accurate location of, of data in time. If you are doing image recognition on pictures in order to, I don't know, recognize uh, faces or objects of, of these kind of things, you are interested in, in the semantic information in the objects and not particularly on their accurate location in space and time. In remote sensing, we 
Actually, we are looking at physical measures which are located in space, latitude, longitude, in a very accurate way. And in time, you have exactly the, the timestamp, the date of, of, where, of what you are looking at. Would it also be fair to say that in remote sensing, Earth observation, we know a lot more about the sensors? You know, the, the position of them, the, the, the way they were calibrated, perhaps some of the information about how the signal degrades as it travels through the through the atmosphere, at, at least this is this is my guess, as opposed to what we might be seeing in, in computer vision. Exactly, exactly. In in computer vision, most of the time you will not use the the position of the camera, the angles, the uh, the illumination of the scene, and in remote sensing, actually, this is very very important. Actually, you know where your satellite is, you know the viewing angle, you know where the sun is, and you have lots of uh, knowledge about the things you observe, the, the processes, the, the surfaces you, you observe, how light reflects on the different kind of surfaces, how light travels through atmosphere, and then you know your sensors very well. You know their noise levels, you know their resolutions, you know lots of things about them. And with all these, you can extract very accurate information about the things you are observing. So I believe earlier on you, you said something about uh, remote sensing Earth observation being more about making physical measurements as opposed to this computer vision world where we're, we're more about pixels. But when I think about RGB imagery, that they are a kind of measurement of reflectance. Are they not? Yes, they are. But you only have three spectral bands, blue, red, and green. And most of the times, the sensors you use in computer vision are not very well calibrated. That means that you have different levels on, on these different three channels, but you are not very interested in the accurate measure of, of the level of light that, that you're measuring. On the other hand, on remote sensing, for example, in optical images, satellites like Landsat or Sentinel-2 or, or satellites like this, you have something like 10 spectral bands. So you have very narrow bands on the infrared, on the red edge, on the, on the shortwave infrared. And you are interested in very accurate measures on these, on these spectral bands because you're going to relate these levels of, of, of measured light uh, to physical phenomena. And, and the relative calibration between these different spectral bands is very important in order to retrieve accurate information about the things you are observing. And in a previous conversation, you, you talked about this, I remember you, you had this, this great quote, it was like, we, we don't need to learn this from data. We, we, we know, we know these physical characteristics about the thing that we're trying to measure. When we think about the differences between computer vision and earth observation, would it be fair to say that when you think about computer vision, we're, we're learning from data? And when we think about Earth observation, we, there are some things we know. We know the physical response of this object to light, as an example. Yes. Actually, in remote sensing, we have models, equations of how uh, light is going to interact with, for example, leaves of uh, vegetation, the canopy, and these kind of things. We have equations which describe how light travels through atmosphere uh, as a function of the quantity of aerosols, of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, and these and this kind of things. And we also have very accurate equations which describe how the sensor works. So combining all these together, we have a very accurate knowledge of how the image is uh, is built, how the, the the image is generated from the observed uh, the observed surfaces. So, uh, I guess in terms of mapping, in terms of object identification, what does this mean when we think about taking algorithms from computer vision? And, and at least my understanding of AI and Earth observation is it started you know taking algorithms from computer vision, ideas from computer vision, and trying to port them over. To Earth observation, and um, what, what kind of barriers do we, do we run into, or or maybe a better question would be, what does this mean for identifying objects? Can we just take computer vision algorithms and poke them into an Earth observation stack? Actually, for uh, some applications, you can. If you are working with very high resolution optical imagery, let's say 50 centimeter images, uh, and you want to count cars on a parking lot or uh, delineate buildings in a city or, or these kinds of, of, of applications, you can use out of the box uh, computer vision algorithms, which will work very well. On the other hand, maybe this is not the 
most, let's say, interesting applications of remote sensing where we are interested in monitoring through time land surfaces, for example, for the growth of vegetation, for uh, climate studies, for deforestation and this kind of applications. In this kind of applications, actually, we are interested in physical magnitudes that we don't directly observe. For example, think about uh, forest biomass. Let's say for climate studies, we are interested in, in monitoring the evolution of, of forest biomass through time. With our satellites, we don't observe forest biomass directly. We observe it through reflectance in the infrared spectrum or through uh, the microwave spectrum if, you, if we use uh, radar images. In order to retrieve this kind of magnitude, forest biomass, we need to use physical models which are going to relate to make the link between this target uh, magnitude, the forest biomass, and we what we observe with the sensors. So I think this provides a great segue into talking about monitoring. Um, you, you were talking about observing change over time, and my guess is it's not just change, but it's it's meaningful change, and then equating that to something like forest biomass as an example. And so here again, I, I see a difference because my, my guess is that when we talk about time series data in Earth observation, uh, we're talking about a whole different scale than we are when we think about time series in computer vision. Yes, in computer vision, when you talk about time series, it's going to be usually video uh, data where you have something like 25 frames per second and this kind of thing. So you have many, many timestamps. In remote sensing, the highest uh, revisit rate that you have is, is daily, let's say. And most of the time is going to be uh, weekly or every 10 days or something like this. So you have time series which are much shorter and, and less dense than, than what you have in, in computer vision. So actually, uh, using computer vision algorithms for, for video data is not straightforward for remote sensing data. And you have to develop custom algorithms for this kind of data. On the other hand, the kind of things that we observe, let's say vegetation growth and, and, and these kind of things, uh, can be easily described with uh, also growth models. You have equations for these kind of things. So you, you can try to apply this kind of prior knowledge in the information extraction from satellite time series for vegetation and, and these kind of surfaces. So uh, another thing I think about when I, when I think about computer vision is deep learning algorithms. It, it feels like it's all the rage these days. People talk about using deep learning to solve all of the problems. When we think about turning unstructured data in an image into, into structured data, into understanding of, of some kind, into knowledge. I remember in a previous conversation with you, you, you talked about that a lot of the operational systems today in, in Earth observation are, are more focused on using machine learning as opposed to, to deep learning to create these land cover classifications. As an example, would you mind explaining to me, please, why this is? What, why doesn't there seem to be more focus on deep learning in terms of operational systems in Earth observation today? Okay. First of all, deep learning is just a subset of machine learning. Machine learning is a set of, of algorithms, techniques that learn from, from data. And deep learning is a particular kind of algorithms uh, of machine learning. The specific thing about deep learning is that deep learning algorithms are, are very costly to train in terms of computational cost, but also in terms of data needed to train them. And then when once the algorithm is trained, its application can also be more expensive that, than classical machine learning algorithms like random forests, for, for instance. And this is why uh, most of uh, ap operational applications of machine learning today are not yet using uh, deep learning because the computational cost to train the algorithms and also the amount of data which is needed to train them. If I put you in a situation where you had unlimited resources and you could do this, like you, you would take your these operational systems and move them away from, from the algorithms you're running on today over to deep learning algorithms, would we see like an increased accuracy? Like I guess what I'm getting at is what would be the return on investment? Like would we see an order of magnitude more accurate data coming out of this? Maybe not an order of magnitude, but I think... Uh that with deep learning, uh, we, we will get more, more accurate results, yes. Deep learning algorithms have more capacity. That means that they are able to, to learn more complex things. So if, for example, if we think about land cover mapping, current algorithms of the kind of, I, I was talking before, or like a random forest, can achieve, can produce 
land cover maps with accuracies between, let's say, 75 and 85% uh, overall accuracy. With deep learning algorithms, you can improve this by, let's say, 5% to maybe 10% depending, of course, on the application, on the nomenclature, on the kind of data that you use, but you can, you can get this kind of improvement. The cost, of course, is that you need much more data to train, not only images, but also the labels, that is the, 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 the information, the ground truth than you, that you need to, to train the algorithms. You said much more data. Would I also need higher resolution in terms of temporal and spatial? No, not, not really. I mean, the, the, the kind of input data, it's not going, not going to be different uh, from what you use for other algorithms like random forest. The difference is the, the, the amount, the amount of data that you need to, to train these algorithms. Again, referring back to a, a previous conversation we had, I remember asking you, like, is this the way we're going? Like, are we just expecting that computation will be, become cheaper, access to data will become better and that we'll move away from this machine learning algorithms that a lot of these operational systems you're talking about today are based on over to deep learning as a function of, oh, it became cheaper and we got more access to data. So, so we did it. Or could, could you imagine something different? I remember you talked about this idea of providers of data having this AI ready data. So pre-processed data that we could plug into these algorithms. Could, could you explain that again and maybe with a little bit more nuance? Yes, of course. So since deep learning algorithms are very uh, costly to train, one thing that, that, that we can do is to pre-train these models. Uh, there are there techniques which are called uh, self-supervised learning, where you can train algorithms without labels. The idea is that you can use the huge amounts of data that you have in, in the archives, uh, all the Landsat archive, all the Sentinel archive. And with this, you can pre-train uh, deep learning algorithms, which are not specific to a particular task. These algorithms are trained to produce different representations of the data, what we can call embeddings or features that then can be used by downstream tasks for which you need fewer training data. The idea is that instead of like we do today, uh, we, we get the, uh, the raw data from the data providers, let's say reflectances from Sentinel-2 or things like this, we would get this, these features, these embeddings, and then we will do our uh, downstream tasks uh, as, as we do today. Instead of starting from the raw data, we will use this, this kind of AI-ready data, which would allow to, to to create these downstream applications, which are specific to different needs. So every downstream model, every downstream application would be specific tailored to the to the different applications of the of the users. Um, I just want to try and clarify something here for a second. So features, embeddings, are these sometimes called vectors? Yes, uh, you can actually. What, what you do from from the let's say machine learning point of view is that you take your your images, your pixels, your spectral bands, and these kind of things, and you transform this into uh, another representation, vectors of, of data um, that that contain the information of the original images, but in a different representation, which is easier to use by by downstream machine learning models. Actually, these these embeddings, what they do is they compress. Uh, the input data in a different representation. It's like if you combine the different spectral bands and the different dates in a time series in order to get a reduced representation of the input data, which contains the meaningful information. Is there any comparison we could draw between the, this vectorized data, this uh, like a compact version of the, the data, just the meaningful piece of the data and the uh, principal component analysis? Yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, when you use, uh, let's say, these embeddings of data, it's just some kind of glorified PCA. <laughs> Instead, uh, you know, principal component anal analysis is just projecting the data in a different space with different properties. When you say that every component is orthogonal to the other ones and has the maximum variance, this is the, the these are the constraints that you use in order to generate principal component analysis. Generic embeddings go beyond that are able to take into account other uh, correlations in the data other dependencies and and more complex information but exactly this is a very very good uh, analogy yes phew finally i got something <laughs> right <laughs> so we're, we're on this idea of um of ai ready data uh, i wonder if we could move along now and talk about 
is some of these different ideas that I, I see out there in, in the remote sensing world. One of them is super resolution. And I think this is a good thing to talk about now because my, my gut feeling is this relates to uh, GANs and, and things like stable diffusion. But if we could start with super resolution just for the time being, if I came to you and I said, hey, I am creating one meter spatial resolution data from Sentinel-2 imagery using super resolution, what, what would you say to me? Okay, uh, going from 10 meter resolution to one meter resolution, it's very difficult and I think it's even impossible. Super resolution is something that we have been doing in remote sensing for years. Uh, we call this deconvolution image restoration. That means that uh, from, a, let's say, 70 meter resolution image, we can try to improve it to go to 60 centimeters, 50 centimeters, things like this, because we are able to increase the high frequency content of the images and reduce the noise levels and these kind of things. Going beyond that uh, means that you are going to use some kind of correlation in the data be it special correlation of if you have multi-temporal data, temporal correlation, in order to increase the high resolution content of your image. But this, this has a physical, a physical limit. If you have 10 meter resolution images, you won't see, uh, let's say, small cars, you won't see uh, a bench on, on a sidewalk and this kind of thing. It's very difficult, even impossible, to restore this kind of information that the, your sensor has not seen. There are techniques which allow to generate one meter resolution images from 10 meter resolution images. And these are images which are plausible. And that means that they are realistic. Uh, you cannot distinguish them from a real image taken at one meter resolution, but that doesn't mean that what your sensor, that the reality that your sensor observed really was corresponding to this one meter resolution image. One of the ways of generating this very high resolution imagery, let's say one meter resolution from 10 meter resolution imagery is using GANs, as you said, uh, generative adversarial networks, which are uh, a family of deep learning algorithms, which I are able to generate synthetic images, which are very realistic. The problem with this is that you can generate information which was not present in the real scene that your sensor observed. Imagine that you you take an image of a parking lot, your sensor at 10 meter resolution, you do a super resolution, your GAN could create cars that were not present in the image. Depending on, on your application, you, you cannot use this kind of image. If your application is counting the exact number of cars that were present on a parking lot at this date, at this uh, geographical coordinates, you don't want a super resolution algorithm which hallucinates information. This is maybe one, also one of the difference of many uh, computer vision application with respect to remote sensing. Computer vision applications, let's say uh, image uh, synthesis, let's say uh, uh, video games and, and these kind of things. One of the goals is to generate new images, to generate uh, plausible images, generate realistic uh, images. In remote sensing, you don't want this. In remote sensing, you are observing a place, uh, a geographical location at a particular date in time. And what you want to get is the reality, which was present at, at this point uh, in space and time. So you cannot uh, use algorithms which hallucinate information, which generate information, which even if it's uh, plausible, if it's realistic, if it doesn't correspond to the reality uh, at that time and, and place, uh, you cannot use them. Well, I think this was a brilliant way of tying that back to exactly what you said at, the, said at the start when we talked about some of the differences between computer vision and Earth observation. And for me, it keeps you keep coming back to that idea of realistic and plausible. So this could be true. And I think about this when you know, I take an image with my with my phone as an example. It is really good at generating plausible, realistic images. But of course, it does some magic in the background and makes it look better than the reality actually was. And I, I think this is what you're talking about in terms of uh, super resolution and GANs and making these plausible images. We want to make measurements of the earth, have that be as close as possible to the reality. Another perhaps a use case for things like super resolution for GANs, for plausible images, is this idea of using synthetic data as, as training data. Is this, uh, what are the pros and cons of, of, of this approach? 
Okay, this this is a very interesting application, of course. As we said before, in order to train deep learning algorithms, we, we need lots of data and we need lots of labeled data. Uh, one way to get this is, of course, simulate simulate the data. So, of course, you could use GANs and this kind of, of, of generative models in order to generate realistic data that you can use to train your deep learning algorithms for remote sensing. On the other hand, as I said before, for most of the applications of remote sensing, we have lots of prior physical knowledge of what we observe and how we observe it. So we have models of the processes that we observe, the growth of vegetation, the deforestation, and these kind of things. And we have models for the sensors and the image generation process. So actually in remote sensing, we have been doing this for, for many years, using these physical models to generate images that we use in order, maybe not to train algorithms, but in order to understand how the, the things that we observe behave and how sensors behave and these kind of things. So image uh, simulation in order to, uh, let's say, calibrate models or, or train models is something that we do in remote sensing. Uh, we have been doing it for, for a long time. So maybe you could say, if we have all these physical models, maybe we don't need GANs and these kind of things in order to generate synthetic data. On the other hand, there are things that we are not yet able to fully comprehend, to fully understand about the physics of processes or things for which uh, we simply don't have physical models. Maybe we don't have a physical model for, let's say, some events, some rapid changes, some, uh, or the models which would be very, very complex. What is interesting with uh, this kind of, of deep learning algorithms like GANs is that you can generate realistic images without introducing in the in the process the physics needed to generate these images so in this kind of application generative models could be very useful in order to generate realistic data to train models to calibrate models and and this kind of applications so actually there's there's a balance between the two for the things for which you know the physics and you have all the prior information you need you don't need to use these generative processes in order to generate realistic images because you you have you have the equations you have the physics on the other hand for phenomena for which you don't have uh, the models you can use the ca this kind of of, of techniques uh, in order to provide synthetic da data but there's another place where uh, machine learning or deep learning can be very useful is when uh, you need to use a physical model for doing data simulation, for doing uh, geophysical variable retrieval. And you need, you need a physical model to, to do these kind of things. But sometimes these physical models are, are very complex, very costly to run because you have to solve differential equations and, and these kind of things. And what you can do in this kind of, of situations is replace some part of the physics by a simplified model, which is trained, which corresponds to a, a machine learning model. And this is what, what uh, we call physical informed neural, neural networks, PINs, which actually are used to replace sometimes physics on, on complex simulation models to speed up things, to reduce co co computational cost. So we've come a long way in the conversation. We've covered a lot of ground in terms of the, the differences between um, computer vision and what, what's happening in AI and Earth observation. What, what would you say to someone who's just starting out in the field of, of Earth observation? Would you, would you say, hey, just focus on the AI stuff, become a programmer, learn how to develop software, um, focus on the computer vision because Earth observation will catch up or there'll be a lot of crossover between those things? Or would you say, hey, I, I think you should understand a lot more about physical processes, about how light interacts with, with, with objects on the Earth's surface? Yes, well, I think what is interesting today is that you can come to remote sensing field from, from both ends. You can come from more from the, let's say, geosciences, uh, physical modeling side of things, or you can come from the computer vision, from the AI uh, field. But what is interesting is that you, you need to be in, interested in both of them. You try to, to marry the, the, the two kinds of expertise. But would you say there's a future for people in Earth observation? And, and this is a very sort of definitive question, and I appreciate that there might not be a definitive answer. But in your mind, uh, is there a future for people in Earth observation that cannot code, that cannot create their own software? I don't think so. Uh, if if you think of, of data science, uh, you know, there's this Venn diagram of data science where, where you have three components. You have the 
let's say, the, the, the computer science, the, the coding, the, the software engineering. Then you have the, the applied math, statistics, AI, and these kind of things. And then you have the third uh, circle in the, in the Venn diagram, which is domain expertise. And I think the three of them are, are needed in order to, to really uh, go forward and do interesting things. Of course, you don't need to be uh, excellent at the three but uh, you need to know to have some knowledge of each each one of them in order to really do interesting things so if if you are say uh, a geoscientist and and you know a little bit of statistics you need to know a little bit of code in order to to really implement things if you come from computer vision and you know a, a bit of statistics and ai you need to get interested in the in the physics of things in order to really develop these these skills and and, and go forward and, and if you had to recommend one language to someone starting out what what would it be python Nowadays, uh, in, in remote sensing, uh, there are lots of libraries. You have Raster.io, you have uh, uh, GeoPandas, you have Fiona, you have uh, all these geomatics uh, tools that allow you to, to process data. You have also all the AI uh, libraries like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and these kind of things for the statistics and, and, and the AI. So uh, I think Python is the, the most interesting language in, in, for, for the field uh, nowadays. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would, would agree with you on that. But when you think about Earth observation, is there any particular, I don't know, segment or sector of it that, that you feel is not getting the attention that it deserves? Do you mean in terms of uh, of applications, in terms of uh, kind of data? I'm thinking about in terms of applications, you know, problems to solve. Well, um, what I think is that we are not fully exploiting the, the richness, the wealth of information that we have in, in high resolution time series. Um, you know, we, we, we have the, the Landsat program, uh, which has been running for something like 30, 40 years now. Uh, since uh, 2015, we have the, the Sentinels, uh, mainly Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, which are providing data every five or six days over the, the whole Earth. And actually, most of the time, for most of applications, we are using just a couple of dates uh, or even sometimes a single date in order to produce maps, in order to detect things, in order to estimate variables. And the time resolution aspect of, of this data, it's not fully exploited. Okay, so when you say that, I'm assuming you, you're saying that because you think we could get a lot more out of it than, than what we than what we are, are doing today. Um, what's stopping us from doing that? I mean, because th this data is available, we have algorithms to work on it. But why aren't people f fully exploiting it, as you say? Yes, the problem with time series is that you, you are uh, very quickly dealing with uh, huge amounts of data. If you want to monitor, let's say, agricultural plots, uh, agricultural fields for a uh, an agricultural season in, in temperate countries, this, this means something like 12 to 14 months of data. Uh, getting all this data every five days at 10 meter resolution on, on a wide area, this means uh, huge uh, amounts of data. So you need to, to get this data, you need to download it, you need to process it, and you need to extract the information. So uh, this means that you need... Uh, you need uh, computational resources, which may be expensive. When I, when you were talking there, I was thinking, yeah, but what what about things like um, Google Earth Engine, for, for as an example, or Microsoft's Planetary Computer, or perhaps Sentinel Hub? I mean, th these platforms have access to that data. They have APIs. They have other ways of interacting with the data. It's collected there. Surely, just collecting all that data over a specific area is as simple as, as writing a little bit of perhaps JavaScript or um, sending the right request to the right API. Yes, th these kind of platforms are, are very interesting because they have opened the possibility to, to many people to access the, this huge amount of data together with the computational resources to process this data. So this is, is, is very interesting. And, and this, of course, opens the, the possibility to, to do this kind of studies using long, long time series. But I think it's, it's just a matter of, uh, let's say, inertia in the remote sensing community for, where for many, many uh, years we have been using just uh, one or two images uh, together to, to, to produce the, the results. I always find this interesting, right, because there's so much opportunity. I mean, I can hear it in your voice when you talk about it. We could do so much more. And I think the question is, like, is the market there for it? 
because obviously, clearly, there, there's uh, an expense involved here, whether it's time, whether it's um, resources involved to like change my algorithms to make to collect this data, to uh, the, the cost of running it on you know, a server farm or, or whatever. Like there, there's an expense involved, and is my return on my investment gonna be worth it? I guess can I sell this as a product to someone else, or is it just good enough that w- what we're doing at the moment? Okay, I I know nothing about the commercial side of things. I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm I have only worked in in scientific applications, so I I can I can't answer with respect to this this economical aspects of, of return on investment. Uh, I don't know. For for scientific scientific applications, uh, the the only thing that could stop us using these kind of platforms is that uh, most of the time we don't have access to, to the right uh, level of, of data. Sometimes we uh, we need information which is not available in the data collections which are which are available on these platforms. Or sometimes we don't have the credits to run the expensive computations that we need on on, on these platforms. You know, I, I think that this makes a lot of sense. I mean, creating access for a lot of people often means that you you have to like relinquish some of that fine grain control that my guess is you as a scientist are, are looking for yes well Jordi, i think this is probably a great time to to round off the conversation i, I really appreciate your time it's a complex thing to explain and <laughs> especially when you're talking to a non-expert like myself i i think you've done a, a brilliant job of of walking me through this hopefully helping the the listeners as well to understand more about the, the differences between computer vision and AI in, in Earth observation. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate your time. Is there somewhere people can go if they want to reach out to you or if they want to continue this conversation or perhaps uh, see some of the work that, that you're doing? Well, I'm not active on social media, but I, I can provide you my contact information so you can add it to the show notes if, if you want to. Yeah, I, I would really appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for your time. It's been, it's been great talking with you. Thanks for having me. It was fun and, and interesting. Thank you very much. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Geordie. There'll be a bunch of links in the show notes today. Firstly, of course, there'll be a link to where you can catch up with Geordie on on LinkedIn. I think that's probably a good place to start. He's not incredibly active, but he does pop by from time to time. I'm also going to include links to episodes around super resolution. There's a fantastic episode in the archives around fake satellite data, and this kind of ties in with with the idea of synthetic data, super resolution, generating data, uh, which I think is an an interesting idea to sort of wrap your head around and and I've also published episodes about the platforms that we talked about towards the end end of the conversation so those three platforms were Google Earth Engine, Microsoft Planetary Computer and of course Sentinel Hub and bear in mind Synergize the company behind Sentinel Hub sponsors this episode so just bear that in mind (laughs) right that's it for me that's it for this week's episode I hope that you'll join me again next week we'll talk soon bye